Ten years after the Battle of Marathon came the Battle of Thermopylae. The first Persian attempt to conquer mainland Greece, led by Darius the Great, failed at Marathon. Although he could have tried again, Darius was too busy with other things to do, namely a rebellion to quell in Egypt. Darius died without ever being able to return to Greece and left his throne to his son, Xerxes. Xerxes, who proved his merits as the new Persian king by successfully subduing the Egyptian revolts, decided that it was finally time to deal with the arrogant Greeks, who had dared to resist his father ten years before. Persia was once again on the move. If Marathon taught the Persians one thing, it was that subduing mainland Greece wouldn't be easy. So this time, the Persians made sure to prepare a much grander expedition. So grand, in fact, that the King of Kings himself, Xerxes, led the enormous army in person. The army was followed by the grandest of fleets. This was another lesson that the Persians realized. If one wants to control the land, you must be able to dominate the seas. Xerxes and his army crossed the Hellespont, now known as the Strait of the Dardanelles, and entered Europe from Asia on a bridge made of ships. Meanwhile, the navy followed along the coast, ready to assist with supplies, provisions, and aid. To help the navy's flow, Xerxes ordered for a canal to be cut through the Mount Athos Isthmus. Now, while we may have doubts about the Persians actually having the command of millions of men and thousands of ships as ancient historians fabled, there is no doubt that the Persian Empire definitely had an impressive amount of resources. And Xerxes, determined not to repeat the mistakes of his father, made sure to source enough strength to annihilate any resistance. And naturally, he was indeed met with resistance. The two main Greek cities, Sparta and Athens, decided to resist no matter the costs. Luckily for them, the Greek terrain is naturally mountainous, full of steep inclines and narrow passages that would make it difficult for big armies to maneuver. Perhaps a handful of picked warriors would manage to pin the enemy down and buy their people precious time. All they needed was to choose the right spot. And that spot was the Thermopylae Passage, the forced passage that took you from Thessaly directly to the heart of Greece. Today, the shoreline of Thermopylae has advanced by more than two kilometers. But in 480 BC, the narrowest point of the passage would have been less than 100 meters wide, making it the perfect spot for the Greek army to occupy. So the Greek army, under the leadership of one of the two Spartan kings, Leonidas, marched to the Thermopylae to stop the enemy at the gate. And just to clarify, Spartans were not the only ones under Leonidas who tried to stop Xerxes. In fact, the Greek army consisted of around 7,000 Greeks, of which only the famous 300 were from Sparta. The others were from other city-states, such as Tegea, Mantinea, Corinth, and so on. And when a Greek city goes to war, and Sparta is on their side, Spartans command. Everyone else has to obey. But the Greeks were still too few. Xerxes had chosen the right moment to attack. Greece was in the middle of the Olympic Games, which at the time were not simply a sporting event, they were first and foremost the most important religious festivity in Greece. We have to understand that the worship of the gods was the most important thing for anyone in ancient Greece, even more important than the imminent aggression from a foreign power. Every Greek city had dedicated their resources to the event, leaving very little to use to stop their invader. Like the Persians, the Greeks 
also had a fleet that was mainly manned by Athenians, who had not been sea warriors until recently. Athenians were mostly merchants, widely accustomed with marine navigation, but not so much with handling warships. Athens had only recently made the political decision to construct a strong navy. A decision taken by Athenian politician and leader of the Democratic Party, Themistocles. Themistocles today would be referred to as a populist, which is what his rivals like to label him as. He was a man who constantly tried to earn the confidence of the masses. And it's because of this that he was able to pass the proposal of building a strong military navy. While he'd argued that the reason for needing one was to be prepared for Persia's return, there was another, more important reason he lobbied for such a proposal, the creation of jobs. As a populist, this was where Themistocles' motivations lay, because he knew that assembling a massive navy would not only create many jobs just to build the ships, but even more to keep them in the sea, as they were rowing ships. So a navy of hundreds of triremes also meant needing tens of thousands of rowers. So, naturally, they voted Themistocles and won him a position of power. Therefore, the Greeks, thanks to Themistocles' populist politics, had their own navy available to them. And while the other cities had some ships to contribute, the Athenian share was by far the biggest. But what they made up in size, they lacked in battle expertise. So they were kept near the coast to wait and see what happened. Speaking of size, Herodotus actually insisted that the Persian navy was much bigger than that of the Greeks. We did not even have 400 triremes, while the Persians had 1,200. Interestingly enough, 1,200 was also the same number of ships during the Trojan War. Perhaps it's a coincidence, or maybe the number was just simply particularly loved. What we can be sure of is that the Persian navy was superior to that of the Greeks. But to make matters a bit more complex, it was actually partly Greek as well. Ships from Greek cities in Asia Minor made up approximately half of Xerxes' navy. One of these cities, Halicarnassus, was commanded by Queen Artemisia, leading her warriors in person. Every ship had an expert crew, with people who knew not only how to navigate the seas, but also how to superbly fight on water. Herodotus himself acknowledged that the Persian ships were technically superior to their Greek counterparts. They were faster, nimbler, lighter, while the Athenian ships were heavier, bulkier, and manned by inexperienced crews. The prospects weren't looking good for the Greeks. And when the fighting began, things went from bad to worse. Because while the Leonidas hoplites, who blocked the Thermopylae, actually managed to resist the Persians' attempt to force their way through for three days, the Persians discovered a way to pass through another valley and get round them. When the Greek army realized the enemy had outflanked them, they decided to quickly abandon the pass. But it was almost too late. If they were to have a chance to flee to safety, someone needed to stay behind. Someone needed to make the ultimate sacrifice. That day at the Thermopylae, Leonidas and his loyal 300 Spartan men fought together until the bitter end. According to Herodotus, King Leonidas' decision was not one made on impulse. Leonidas had gone to consult the Oracle of Delphi, who, known for its ambiguous answers, told him, either your great and glorious city must be wasted by Persian men, or if not that, then the bound of Lacedaemon must mourn a dead king. 
Remember that the world the Greeks lived in was one dominated by gods, omens and predictions. We could dismiss these parts of the story thinking they are not important, but that would mean not to understand how the ancient Greek thought. These were the people who would rather risk their livelihood and continue the Olympic Games rather than anger the gods. So when the time came to decide who should be sacrificed at the Thermopylae, Leonidas had no doubts. The alternative would have been the destruction of Sparta, a price far too high for a king. As this was happening over the course of two days, the navies were also engaged in a battle at Cape Artemisium. The fighting was confused and chaotic, and both navies suffered heavy losses that showed neither side to be the victor. As the Greek generals considered their options, they received news that the Persian army broke through the Thermopylae and that the Greek army had fled. Deciding to follow suit, the Greek navy retreated as well and docked on the island of Salamis, approximately seven miles from Athens. Ten years before, at Marathon, the Greeks managed to stop the Persian conquest of Greece, leading many to consider that battle as a decisive one in human history. Who knows what would have happened if the Persians won at Marathon and entered Greece? Well, this time, the Persians broke through. Fortunately, Athens acted quickly, and the city was evacuated in time, having fled to the Peloponnese Peninsula and other islands. This was not an easy decision to make. The gods, according to mythology, lived in the Acropolis, right in the middle of the city. Abandoning the home of their gods to leave at the mercy of the enemy was unfathomable to the Athenian people. Thankfully, a priestess who guarded the Acropolis stated that yes, the population had to go because even Athena herself had left the city. The sacred snake, which they believed to be the representation of the goddess, had disappeared and hadn't resurfaced for several days. Even the gods left. It was safe to leave. But not everyone left the city, because there was another oracle who had predicted, Though all else shall be taken, Zeus, the all-seeing, grants that the wooden wall only shall not fail. Debates raged on what the oracle meant. On one hand, some advised staying behind, for they interpreted the wooden walls to mean the walls that surrounded the Acropolis. But Themistocles offered another interpretation. The wooden wall refers to the ships, and therefore everyone must go to Salamis, where the navy was docked. But according to Herodotus, a group of Athenians refused to go and fortified the wooden wall that surrounded the Acropolis, confident that the oracle was right and that the wall would not fail. Despite their efforts and confidence, the city was taken by the Persians. A few days later, Athens was reduced to ashes. What was there left to do? Luckily, the Greek army was still intact. The Spartans decided that with Athens in ruins, they needed to defend the Peloponnese at all costs, which, not coincidentally, is where Sparta is. The Peloponnese was again easy to defend because they had the Isthmus of Corinth, which was another thin passage that could have given the Hoplites army an opportunity to confront an enemy much larger than itself. So they started fortifying the Isthmus of Corinth. But there's a catch. They're vulnerable to an attack from the back. If they went round the Isthmus and started disembarking troops on the Peloponnese, all hope would truly be lost. This fear of the Persian navy pushed Themistocles to hatch a cunning plan. In the midst of retreat, he began to leave engravings addressed to the Greeks from Asian Minor who were fighting in the Persian navy. Men of Ionia, you do wrongly to fight against the land of your fathers and bring slavery upon Greece. It would be best for you to join yourselves to us. But if that should be impossible for you, 
then at least now withdraw from the war. If neither of these things may be, we ask you not to use your full strength in the day of battle. Did Themistocles hope this would convince the Greeks to switch sides? According to Herodotus, Themistocles' plan was slyer than one might think at first glance. There was no guarantee that the Greeks would take the bait, but Xerxes certainly would. Once the great king catches wind of the propaganda targeted at his Greeks, he would no longer trust them. And the Persian navy heavily relies on Greek triremes. The Greek navy was now bottled in a tight gulf with only two tight exits, surrounded by land owned by the Persians. If Xerxes decided to blockade the two entries to the gulf, the Greek fleet would be helplessly trapped. Stressed from the knowledge of this, the Greek admirals on the ships began infighting. The Spartans tried to persuade them to abandon the plan and flee towards the Peloponnese. But the Athenians obviously didn't want to leave, unwilling to let go of their last hope of taking Athens back. By this point, the cunning Themistocles found yet another stratagem. Themistocles sent one of his slaves to Xerxes to express an acknowledgement of defeat and a willingness to join his side if he attacked immediately. This would give the Greeks a fighting chance because if the Persians attacked in the narrow gulf, their advantage would be nullified. There was simply no space to maneuver in such a tight place, no matter how expert the crew or how nimble the ship was. However, if the Persians simply decided to block the entries, the Greeks would have no chance but to surrender. We don't know if Xerxes believed Themistocles' ploy or if he even received the message at all. What we do know is that Xerxes orders his navy to launch an attack immediately. The Persian navy moved a small number of ships to stop one side, while the majority poured in through the other. Each trireme was built with a ram on the bow of the ship, designed to breathe through the hull of an enemy ship. The battling triremes would try to ram each other with these, while other ships would drive alongside the flanks of the enemy to try and break their paddles. As we know, the Persian fleet was superior in this. However, as Themistocles hoped for, there was simply no space for this kind of maneuvering. What happened instead is that the Persian ships began to pile up. The only solution now was for the men to physically fight each other on board the ships. Great news for the Greeks, as their hoplites were covered with bronze, while the enemy's soldiers were only lightly armed and weak in fighting melee. Half of Xerxes' navy was supposed to have come from Greek colonies in Asia Minor, which means the Persians too should have had ships full of hoplites covered in bronze. But there's no record of them to be found. This leaves us wondering whether Themistocles' plan really did work in the end. Maybe Xerxes really did so fear the Greek fleets under his command would betray him, convinced by Themistocles' propaganda that he didn't bother sending them into battle. Except, of course, for Queen Artemisia, who we do know had his full trust and fought on the front lines of the battle with her contingent. Countless ships carpeted the sea, and on them were the Greek hoplites fighting for Greece, going from deck to deck and wiping out the enemy crews. Xerxes, according to the legend, overlooked the battle from a high throne, hoping to enjoy the triumph, but witnessed instead the crushing defeat of his fleet. One after the other, the Persian triremes were captured and the crews eliminated. By that point, what was left of the Persian navy abandoned the scene and fled. That was it. The battle was lost. The Greek navy officially controlled the sea, and the second attempt of Persia's invasion on Greece was, once again, a failure. A battle that changed the history of the world had been fought and won by the Greeks. 
The Greek epics of the Persian Wars have been one of the myths that founded our modern civilization. Leonidas, Thermopylae, and the 300 are names that everyone still recognizes today. Our civilization boasts to be a Western civilization, based on democracy and freedom, capable of defending itself from the threats from the East. An East fraught with tyrants, oppression, cruelty, and barbarians. This sharp way of dividing the world into us and them was something the ancient Greeks did extensively. And by convincing ourselves that we are like the Greeks, or at least the descendants of the Greek civilization, we got used to doing it ourselves. We tend to forget that reality was a bit more complex than us and them. Even the cunning Themistocles, Athenian populist responsible for the heroic victory in Salamis, if we stop and look at his character a bit closer, we would discover, after some time, Themistocles lost the elections in Athens and decided to search for luck elsewhere. He joined the ranks of the king of Persia, and when he died, he was the governor of a Persian province. The fact that the Greek leader who heroically repelled the eastern invasor ended up as a Persian governor opens our eyes to the idea that reality is more complicated than it looks. Even so, the defense of Europe against the Asiatic hordes mattered so little to Themistocles that he named one of his daughters Asia. But perhaps the most interesting thing that we got from this invasion is Aeschylus's play, The Persians. The Persians is the oldest Greek tragedy that has been preserved. It was written eight years after the Battle of Salamis and invokes the struggle and spirit of that victory. But what makes the play extraordinary is that it is written from the point of view of the defeated enemy, rather than that of the victorious Greeks. The atmosphere is dark. It's a strange way to celebrate your own victory over a hated and despised enemy. During a time of peak division, Aeschylus displayed a rare show of empathy in being able to view something from the perspective of others. Although the ancient Greeks displayed a sense of divisiveness that still exists in the world today, it's still true that we have much to learn from them. And even if they only left us the ability to empathize with our worst enemies, they would still surely be invaluable. The majority of the information in this video comes from this book by Professor Alessandro Barbero. We want to thank him for his kind cooperation in helping us tell this story through his lens. If you want to check out his audiobook, the link is down below in the description. If you understand Italian or you are learning the language, we highly suggest you check it out.